so then the um the whole book is going to end at a point of uh, of reconciliation and we'll see uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to just sit think about what we read throughout the whole safe air and think about how it, it's come and tied together um, for us after this month of learning that we have done so the um so chapter 12 just for thematic uh review um <laughs> chapter 12 begins with two verses that really that pick up on themes that we um, we have we have seen a lot of thus far in in the safe air so um it begins with with kind of this uh this voice the voice of god um, so we see Ephraim, um, which the tribe of Israel, the tribes of Israel, the northern kingdom, which is who Hosea addresses, uh, and he calls them Ephraim, and there's this kind of, um, he accuses them of deceit or of sneakiness, mirma, um, and chachash, right? There's, there's something sneaky about the way that they behave, and one of the things that we have talked about um, over the course of this Sefer is what God is accusing of as sneakiness is this kind of like flipping back and forth that they, they serve God, you know, they're, they're bringing sacrifices, but they're also kind of cheating on God. And they're also worshiping other idols and they're not really relying on Hashem. They're also relying on their foreign, um, military alliances. And there's this kind of two-facedness that, um, that B'nai Israel have. And then there's this line also here that, that's here about Yehuda, the relationship of Amos to Yehuda is a, in general an interesting question. Here he kind of says, no, don't worry, Yehuda, you're doing well. Um, but then continues with the rebuke of Ephraim. Ephraim ro'e ruach. Ephraim is a ro'e, a shepherd, but not for sheep. He is a herder for wind, meaning he's gathering in nothingness. Um, the Rodef Kadim Kol Hayom and chases the east wind all day. That there's this like wandering after and gathering in and working on nothingness. So it reminds us of this image of um, you reap what you sow, right? There was this the uh, in, in in chapter eight. There was this, uh, a line about how they plant wind and it grows into a whirlwind. There's um, imagery of them wandering around like a donkey, not knowing where they belong. So there's just this, they're engaged in meaningless nothingness. Um, and what is so wrong about what they're doing? It's the Ben Adam L'chavero um, perversions. It's the lying and the stealing that so angers God. And also not just the way they treat other people, but it's also the relationship they have with other nations, which was a major theme of our class. Uh, last week when we talked about why it is, or two weeks ago, I don't remember when it was, um, why it is that God is so upset about the Brit Im Ashur that they're making, the covenant they make with Ashur, and Shemen Limitzrayim Yuval, and they're carrying oil to Egypt. Oil was a primary export of Israel. So if there's been a lot of oil being given to Egypt, it's indicative of a good relationship, maybe a trade relationship, maybe a political alliance. And so with that, um, we, we kind of open chapter 12. This is familiar territory for us. The somewhat unique to these chapters, although I included a few verses from chapters nine and 10, um, is, a, is a little kind of literary move or polemical move that Hosea makes that might be surprising to us. Hosea references a number of kind of stories from what I guess he would call Jewish history. To us, he's referencing um, events and stories that take place earlier in Tanakh. And he has a kind of interesting take on some of these narratives. First of all, the events in Jewish history or the events from the rest of, you know, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh that he chooses to reference are interesting. He's clearly making very conscious choices about what events in the Bible he's talking about. And then we're going to see even the resonance that he gives these events are very different than what most of those resonance of those events, let's say, have if you're like learning in a Parsha class and you're learning these stories in Sefer Bereshit or you're learning this story in Sefer Shoftim. It's not necessarily the takeaway that you would have in your Tanakh class, but Hosea is standing up and giving a Tanakh lesson that might 
catch us a little bit by surprise. And the question we need to ask ourselves is, why is Hosea portraying biblical events or Jewish history events, however you wanna think about it, um, why is he portraying these events in the way that he does, right? What does that accomplish for him? And what do we make of that, uh, that portrayal of these events that we, that we should be relatively familiar with, okay? So let, let's take a look at them together. So in, um, this is going back a little bit, this is going back to chapter nine. Um, and this is in, you know, in a stage where Hosea is saying, you know, um, right? they, they're really, they're doing bad things. Like in the days of Giva, I'm gonna remember their avon, their sin, and I will remember um, the, their offense, if code, that verb is going to show up a lot actually in this week's class. It means, it means I'm going to recall it for the purposes of punishing, right? Or like of acting in this case for punishing. And what is he comparing them to? Okay. We learned a story. Does anybody remember? Let's see a little time for some audience participation. We learned a story together. I believe it was probably last summer that took place in Giva. That is a Yucky story to remember. Anybody remember? It's okay if not, it's a long time ago. It was, I didn't yeah, learn it with, I didn't learn it with you, but it was the, the story about the Pilagesh Begiva. Yes, good. You both, horrible, yeah. horrible story. Horrible, horrible story. We, some of us learned it together. Some of us may have learned it separately. Some of us have maybe been blessed enough to go their whole lives without having had to have read it. Um, a horrible, horrible story of um, a man taking his pilegash and, and giving, and she gets raped in Giva by the Israelites. And then he cuts her up in like potentially while she's alive in pieces and sends her out all over the lands of Israel. And then all of Israel gather in war against the tribe of Binyamin and basically complete have a civil war and basically completely kill Binyamin. Like this is a yucky, yucky story, right? If we're going to remember times in B'nai Israel's history, this is really one of, it's one of the pits, right? And Hosea says, you guys are acting just like you acted then, right? That's the resonance that Giva has. You're acting just like you acted then. And um, that's that's reference number one. So we have our first reference, which is to the story of Pilagesh Begiva and the war against the civil war against Benjamin. Then the reminiscence, the, the, the tone of the recollections shift a little bit. Israel. Israel, I found you like grapes in the wilderness. Now, grapes are a very well cultivated plant, and it is not normal to find a beautiful, delicious grapevine in the middle of the wilderness. Right, so what's, God, God, it's like, wow, what a pleasant surprise that I found you. But what is this clearly referring to whenever we talk about the Midbar? When Hashem brought them out and they were, they needed to be totally reoriented and Hashem cultivated them. Good, Hashem cultivated them when he took them out of Egypt. And when we think about this, so if we look, look at this next line, um, so you were, I saw you, right? I'm sorry, I saw your fathers, like the first fig that appears on the tree, right? Like this like beautiful moment of blossoming, blossoming right? The Bikurim that we think about, right? These blossoming, beautiful fruits. They're new, they're fresh. It's exciting, it's lovely. And it's right, this brand new relationship. And that is when, you know, that was when we were in the wilderness. And if we recall, the, the image of the wilderness in Hosea has a certain resonance because there's other sections where Hosea says, I'm going to take you back Right, with the, the reconciliation. I'm going to take you back into the wilderness and I will speak words, right? I will midaber to you. I'll speak to you bamidbar in the wilderness to, to make a rejoining of our relationship, a recultivating of this beautiful time that we had when you followed me in faith. So this is this beautiful image and recollection of the positive time in the wilderness, in the midbar. By the way, 
not everybody remember if you read Sefer Bamidbar, that's a interesting way to remember this time in the desert, which like was filled for at least some of it with a lot of complaining and a lot of griping. And, and yet now it's like, oh my gosh, wow, that was such a wonderful, beautiful time that we had together when we were walking through the wilderness and you were like new grapes. But then what happened? Hema ba'u el ba'al pa'or. You went to ba'al pa'or. V'yinazru Liboshet, and you served, Liboshet is, is an embarrassment or it's a shameful God. The Midrash highlights this specifically, but the rabbis tell us that the way one would serve the Avodah Zarah of Baal Pa'or was very yucky. It was a very shameful way. Basically, they would defecate on or in front of the idol, which is like a little, girl, like, I don't really get why that's like cute. Like, why is that an exciting thing to do? Um, and they were gross. Ke'ahavam, they became just like the ones that they loved, right? This image of like, I loved you, we were in the desert, we had this wonderful time, and then you went and did something disgusting, right? And I was repulsed by that, I was repulsed by you. Okay, so this is recollection of event number two of this time in the desert as super positive and wonderful, but then also remembering the low point of the Midbar as Baal Pa'or, of this perversion, this leaving God. And then Hosea um, later on comes back to this point in verse 15. And he, um, he says, Kol ra'atam begilgal. They have all of this evil, right? They had evil in Gilgal. Okay, that's a place. Start thinking now about what you know happened in Gilgal. By the time we reach the end of the Pasuk, we'll come back to it. He says, I right, you had all of this evil at Gilgal. Kisham senetim. I hated them. Woo. Ah, right. God saying, I hated B'nai Israel when they were at Gilgal. I'll ro'am alaleham for the bad for what they did. And so therefore, mi beti agar shame, I'm kicking them out of my house. Lo osif ahavatam, I cannot love them anymore. I won't continue to love them. Kol sarehem sorurim. All of their sarehem, all of their nobles, all of their appointed officials are sorurim, are bad, um, bad guys. My, the translation here is the altar translation, which reflects the alliteration in the Hebrew, right? Their nobles are knaves. The Hosea is kol sarehem sororim. This is an alliteration that was also used in Sefer Yishayahu by Yishayahu when he was talking about the same, the same reality. Um, so God says, I hated you in Gilgal, what you did. I don't love you anymore. I'm kicking you out of my house and all of your leaders are, are bad. Does anybody remember what happened in, in Gilgal? This is a few things. A few things happened in Gilgal, but any any guesses? It's a little esoteric, and I also am not great with geography. I only know this because I looked it up. Um, it is possible here that Hosea is referring to B'nai Israel's request for a king. That's one of the things that happened in Gilgal. B'nai Israel asked for a king, and then when they decided they wanted to re- kind of uh, rededicate the kingship to Shlomo HaMelech and they went to Gilgal to do that. And now that's a really interesting thing. And it, but it actually makes a lot of sense in the verse because part of what God talks about is the punishment is and what he's so upset is that they're going to kind of get exiled and their, their Sarehem, their leaders are messed up right now, right? So that's, that's possible. But part of, but this really fits in a lot of ways and this fits in a lot of ways with the frustration that Hosea expresses in many points throughout the Sefer with it, of his disappointment in B'nai Israel in, with their kings and their leaders. He talks about how there's all this internal corruption, how Hashem didn't choose them. These kings, these kings came to power by murdering one another, by coups. They're relying on political alliances and not on God. So we know Hosea is very upset about the kingship. And he touches on it at, at Gilgal. And what's fascinating about this is that like Shmuel also was kind of bothered by the fact that they asked, but at the end of the day, when B'nai Israel asked for a king, God said, yes. And we have rules in Sefer Devarim about there being a king. And so there's clearly this like maybe two sides of the coin of kingship. And in this chapter, Hoshea is coming down very hard on the history saying what you did in Gilgal by asking for a king that first time and by establishing a monarchy in Israel, that was bad. That was, you that was no good. You shouldn't have done that. Yeah, Vivian, what's up? They also put into motion all their, once the kingship whole thing started, all their alliances on other countries and not on Hashem. So yes. Was, you know, the arrangements and diplomatic deals. Yes, 
Exactly, right? Hoshea is not enthralled with the kingship. And so he takes that opportunity to kind of talk about it as this very, very negative thing. Which is interesting because when we learn Sefer Malachim, I mean, and Sefer Shmuel, when we, at the beginning of the kingship, I don't know, didn't necessarily seem so bad. Not everybody seemed upset about it. Some people might think it's a good thing. They're fulfilling a mitzvah in the Torah of having a king, right? Like, so Hoshea has a very particular perspective on these aspects of history, and he's clearly choosing somewhat selectively. These, though, I don't even think are the most shocking examples. These are examples of things that either like he's choosing bad moments, Giva, Baal Paor, right? Like we know that those are bad moments. Or he's choosing something that actually throughout all of Tanakh has been developed as ambivalent. Some people think the time in the Midbar was great. Some people think the time in the Midbar was horrible. Some people think the kingship is great. Some people think the kingship is horrible. Hoshea is coming down on the negative Nancy side of everything. But what he's about to do in the chapters that we're going to read for this week, which is chapter 12, is he begins to talk about um, Yaakov. He's going to begin to talk about Yaakov Avinu, our forefather Yaakov, right? Like son of Yitzchak. And the version of the story of Yaakov that he presents is kind of fascinating. Definitely not what you would necessarily find in a day school classroom. Okay. It's important to keep in mind, by the way, um, that uh, Yaakov is kind of an interesting word to use because when you when you use the name Yaakov just like you when you use the name Yisrael it's ambivalent about who to whom you one would be referring right the word Yisrael is originally actually the name of Yaakov right Yaakov Avinu was renamed Yisrael by God and by um by an angel which we're going to talk about in a second um but it also could mean all of Israel his children his descendants B'nai Yisrael so the word Yaakov actually is being used in the same way. Sometimes it's referring to the nation of B'nai Yisrael, and sometimes it's actually referring to our forefather Yaakov. So what we're going, yeah, let's read through it together. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Perak Yud Bet begins with a phrase that we might be somewhat familiar with from the other parts of Sefer Hoshea. It begins with the word veriv or rivu, right? Which literally we would translate often as a fight. But in this connotation, as in the connotation, two pl other places it's appeared in the Sefer, particularly in chapter two, um, it seems to be a court case. This is the language that, the, uh, that Hoshea uses to bring his wife, Gomer, to court for adultery. Okay, this is the language that God uses. It says, you know, uh, that God has a reeve with B'nai Israel for doing Avodah Zarah. Okay, and so this word in Sefer Hoshea for sure has a connotation of you are bringing, being brought to justice because of a bad deed you've done. Okay, so the reeve la Hashem im Yehuda. God has a fight with Yehuda. V'lif kod al Yaakov kidrachav. And also needs to remember, recall, to bring back these memories in order to carry through the justice for what he has done. Because why? Because the way he acted, that is what he should get back. Okay, this is the justice of God. And so the justice states, let's see how Yaakov behaved and that's how he should be treated. And how is Yaakov depicted here? Babeten akav et achiv beono sara et elo uh, sorry yeah sara et elohim. So it's it's reminding us of two stories. It says in the womb akav et achiv he akav he cheated or he tricked his brother. Now. This is, this, we'll actually pause here for a quick second. This, this is referring to, can somebody, does anybody have a guess? What's this talking about? Babeten akav et achiv. When Yaakov was born, he held on to Esau's heel. Okay. So that, you know, so that's the, the Midrash talks about how he's like literally holding on. Because he wanted to come. He and wanted same, to come out first. Yeah. The same Shoresh for Ekev, which means heal, is also to trick because when Esav complains to his father that Yaakov stole his bracha, he uses that same shorash uh, that, that he tricked me. Akveni zeh pa'amayim. Pa'amayim, yes. right, two times. Right, so you trick. So this is the word that who uses? 
ace of, right? This is ace, ace of, of ace word of. for for Yaakov, well, right? Well, Which Yaakov is, to has him. to do good, which has to do with his name, Yaakov. Aiken. There's a lot of like ways you could play with the letters, but the play on words to ace of is, who are you to me? You're a trick, you're a trickster. And so how did this happen in the womb, right? We know that she had a very difficult pregnancy. There's Midrashim about him following afterwards. They were fighting about who's going to get let out first. And how is he tricked in the womb? It has to do with this idea of like, he switched the birthrights, right, around. And so he kind of became the oldest, even though he really wasn't, right? So there's all this trickery that's happening. But what's so interesting about the way Hosea talks about this moment is he's, siding in a way with the version of events that Esav would side with, right? He's saying, Yaakov, actually, you were the trickster, right? You did trick me. You did steal my blessing. You sneaked and you snuck in. You tricked me with the stew, right? You tricked me twice. And this image of Yaakov is not the one that we teach our, let's say, you know, our third graders who learn this story, we say, well, really? Right? We say all the reasons why what Yaakov maybe did wasn't so bad or really why it was okay, right? Like there's actually none of that in Hosea. Hosea just says, Yaakov, you, Yaakov tricked, you know, Babeten. And then it says, but oh no, Sarah et Elohim. And with his power, he fought, he fought, he drove, he fought with Elohim, with God, with the divine being. What's this referring to? The Malach, the Malach of Esau. The Malach of Esau. He was injured in his leg and he was injured in his leg. Good. And the afterward, yes, he was injured with his leg through that. And so that, and that word, that Shora Sarah is also from what the, um, the angel says to him in the morning, right? Sarita im Elohim va'anashim va'tuchal. You struggled, you fought with Elohim, with God or angel, some divine being, and man, and you were capable. And that is the word that it um, that it uses here. By Yasar El Malach, he fought with the angel by Yuchal, and he was capable. Then there's a little bit of ambiguity. Bacha, he cried by Lo, and he pleaded with him. So the text is actually not so clear. It seems from Hebrew, normal Hebrew grammar that this would be Yaakov, that Yaakov is the one who's crying and pleading. But we know from the story in Bereshit that that's not the case, that, that perhaps it was the angel who cried and pleaded with him regardless. But Bebet el yimtza enu, and then we, he found him in Betel. This might be referring to the first conversation that Yaakov had with God. Besham yidaber imanu, and that's, where um, where God spoke spoke with us, but what's interesting is this depiction of this fighting um, is like seems to be placing. There's this ambivalence here im Elohim, and then it says it was a malach, right? But and then you go and then you talk, right? With he's talking to God, but it's like this: you're using your power even to fight with God, right? And either God's crying out or Yaakov's crying out that this is a very morally ambiguous story. Okay, pause for one second. Hosea gets a little distracted. We're going to go with him on his sidebar and then return to the story of Yaakov in one moment. And he says, right, Hosea says, Hashem 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 is God's name. It's unclear why he's emphasizing shame Hashem. It might have to do with the fact that God changed Yaakov's name. Different Prashanim have different comments about this. But he says to them, he says, tashuv Chesed umishpat shemor. Do chesed and do justice. The kavei el the el elohecha tamid. And you should constantly be hoping to God. What is this verse doing here? It seems to be contrasting what Hosea is telling Bnei Yisrael to do, contrasting it to what Yaakov was doing. He said, "Act with chesed and mishpat." Not with tricking your brothers, act with chesed and mishpat. And kavei el elohecha, right? Daven to Hashem, don't fight with Hashem, right? Hope to Hashem, don't fight with Hashem, right? And so this verse perhaps is contrasting saying, don't act like your forefather Yaakov. You have a history of cheating and fighting with Hashem. And don't act that way. And so then we, the Hosea then picks up this cheating thread, right? As opposed to saying, right, saying, 
act with chesed and mishpat, but he's saying, no, kina'an biyado mozne mirma. You are like a kina'an. The word kina'an literally means a traitor, but it has a very negative connotation in the Tanakh, right? It's saying you're a, che a, a cheating traitor and you're making lies. You have, you're using false scales. Um, la asok ahave, you love to cheat people. You're all cheating each other. By Yomer Ephraim, and Ephraim says, Ephraim meaning the people who he's talking to, the people of Israel, what do they say to this, themselves? Ah, Asharti, I got rich. Matsati only, I got power. I have, I found myself power. Ki yigia, I'm sorry, kol yigia, all the things that I've gotten, lo yimtsuuli avon asher chata, with all these things I've gotten, I don't have any sins to worry about. So this picks up on the irony. It's using the same word. He's saying, I've gotten power for myself. That's the, it's, it's um, in a clearly negative way. Um, and it's, that's the same word that Yaakov used, is, uses to describe Yaakov's fight with God. He's using his power in this negative, exploitative way that I've become rich. And he's saying that the, I don't have a sin. And there's another play on words here. The, uh, the Aleph, Vav, Ayin, Vav, the, the um, sounds very similar. So even though it looks different, it would sound similar to people listening. And he says, Matsati only, right? As opposed to Avon. I have own, I have power and I don't have Avon. I don't have sin. Right, and those words would sound, especially in the Hebrew, the way they spoke it back then would sound very similar. So there's this, playing this this linguistic play that's happening here um that is talking about this very thin line between power and sinfulness and this happiness that israel has in their own power that they claim to come without sin but the implication is that perhaps it is not this is also potentially referring to yaakov um, because we have other stories in the tanakh of yaakov becoming extremely wealthy financially how is it that he became wealthy financially he lived in his in Lavan's house and he tried, you know, made a deal with him. And then he like did this, the whole sheep and he bred his sheep in such a way where he really came out on top. And then and love and then he leaves in the middle of the night. He takes his sheep and he leaves. And sure, there's lots of ways we could be Malamed Schut for Yaakov. Lavan cheated him first. Really, this would have been fair. This is part of his deal of what was owed to him. But at the end of the day, when Lavan kind of confronts him, Lavan's like, okay, you kind of just like ran away and stole all my stuff, right? Like Lavan doesn't feel good about it. And Hoshea is almost taking that side here again in this context of talking about Yaakov, saying you, Yaakov's descendants, are doing the same thing. You also are getting rich and you're walking away thinking you haven't done anything wrong, but you're not having that self-reflection that self -reflection and being aware of the, the problematic ways that your power and your wealth have been acquired. Okay. And this drasha about Yaakov continues. Uh, we touch here again on Egypt. And God says, Anochi Hashem Elokecha Me'eretz Mitzrayim Ode. I'm still the God. I'm the same God that brought you out of the lands of Egypt. Ashivcha, sorry, Ode Ashivcha Be'ahalim. I'm still, I want to settle you back in tents. Kimei Moe, like we have these beautiful festivals together. So we have this back and forth again, right? This um, emotional whiplash and God's like, there's all these bad things happening. I wish we could just like hang out in tents and celebrate Sukkot or celebrate Pesach together. Um, he's like, I spoke into all these prophets and yet um, he, he talks again about the, um, the Avodah Zarah that they've been doing. Um, you're sinning and so you're worthless to me, says God. You're bringing all of these, um, these sacrifices, but your altars, he's talking about these Mizbachot, these stone altars, are like Galim al Talmei uh, Sadai. They're like these stones in the middle of a plowed and ready a field, uh, ready ready to go. What's that image? We've seen this image last week. This was a big theme last week of the plowing, the animal, the planting, the reaping, and the sowing. And so God's saying, like your altars are just like a bunch of rocks that are getting in the way of you doing the real work that you need to do to grow the beautiful, right? To grow, learn Torah and to grow uh, beautiful plants. The metaphor being beautiful deeds. Um, so God, right there, we have a little three verse whiplash of God's uh, God's upsetness about Bnei Israel's behavior. And then again, we return to our Yaakov story, um, the Sadeh. Uh, 
seems to be the connecting point here. Um, and it says, Vayivrach Yaakov, stay Aram. Yaakov had to run away to, um, to Aram, to the fields of Aram, to his, you know, his mother's family. Vayavod Yisrael Beisha. And he worked for a woman, Ubiisha Shamar. And he guarded, probably guarded the sheep in order to get a woman, to get a wife. Okay, so it's basically taking all this time and he's saying, why did you do all this work? You did it in order for an Isha, for a woman. Now, there's nothing, we're going to see this is contrasted to um, another figure from Tanakh who God is saying is doing something better. There's nothing I don't think inherent, in general, inherently wrong for working for a woman, but we should also always be keeping in mind Hosea's um, broader context and image and vibe and Hosea's feelings about women, let's just say they're complicated to say the least, right? So for him to say like Yaakov worked in the fields of Aram for in Isha, right? From Hosea, that word probably dripped off of his tongue with a little bit of spite, right? And that gets contrasted to God's behavior through Moshe Rabbeinu bringing Bnei Israel out of Egypt. I brought you out of Egypt with a Navi, says God, right? Navi being Moshe. And I guarded you. They were guarded through a Navi. So this, um, this uh, parallel structure is juxtaposing God's actions of guarding Bnei Israel with a Navi, Uba Navi Nishmor, as opposed to Uba Isha Shamar saying that Yaakov was doing all of this hard work, you know, for, for a woman, which, which Jose is kind of saying in somewhat of a negative light. And this is an, in, ultimately kind of we walk away and we're going to see the ultimate takeaway for God is obviously negative as is most of the things about these feelings in the book, right? But the the feeling that we get here when we read this, this depiction of, um, of Yaakov is extremely negative. He cheats, he abuses his own power in some ways even against and manipulating God. He cares only about financial gain, not about who he steps on to get his money. He's doing all of his work and his effort for a woman, right? Like this is the depiction of Yaakov that Hosea gives. And why is that? Because Yaakov is um, their forefather. And in some ways, Hosea is looking back on history saying, the behavior, B'nai Israel, that you are displaying right now, your abuse of power, your tricking of other people, your financial deceit, your abuses right, of power, all of those things are in your blood, right? Like you're acting like your ancestor, like your forefather. And it's this very negative depiction of B'nai Israel's history, their lineage, their relationship with their forefathers. And it's being brought in stark contrast at so many moments throughout the chapter where all of a sudden God is like, oh my gosh, I wish that we could go back to the time of Egypt. And I said, I'll settle you in little Sukkot and we'll hang out together in the wilderness. Oh, it was so good when I brought you out of Egypt using the prophet. Oh my goodness, when I brought you out of Egypt, you were like these beautiful fresh figs, right? Like there's this, this contrast here. And I think what Hosea is setting up is God's act of protection and um, taking B'nai Israel into a relationship with him, that God did everything that God could have possibly beyond, could have possibly done. And it was so beautiful and tried so hard. And you, B'nai Israel, have ruined it. And you've ruined it in kind of this consistent way. You've kind of maybe always, you know, there's there's always been this seed of, of um, tradition in you of like from your forefathers that you just, you're not, you're just not doing the right thing. Right. You're, you're very, a very negative, um, a negative depiction of who B'nai Israel are and who they can be. He doesn't give him a pass for it being genetic. <laughs> no, <laughs> he does not. And that's why, by the way, always that's so fascinating. Oh, sidebar, 740. Okay. I'm doing it anyway. Um, I just love that you brought up that point because I was in something I was learning today. There's a Gemara in Sanhedrin 
that's like so amazing. Maybe one day I'll teach this year at the Jewish center of the Gemara, but it's basically like why were people, all people created from one being from Adam Harishon? Like why didn't God just like create multiple groups of people? And there's lots of really fascinating um, answers that are given, but one of them is for the righteous people and for the Rishaim that the righteous people shouldn't be able to say, I'm righteous because my ancestors are righteous. And the Rishaim, the evil people shouldn't be able to say, I'm bad because my ancestors were bad or my parents were bad. And it's so, that was like, mm, such muster, right? That like, you don't get to say like, oh, I come from a good family. Maybe I get a free pass. What if I do won't be so bad, right? Like, no, you wanna be a righteous person. You gotta be a righteous person. and people who are doing bad things don't get to just blame it all on the chance of their life and their upbringing and my parents and if they blah, 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 right? So there's, I, I do that just, your comment really reminded me of, of that Gemara, um, which I, I think is I think is really relevant for, for this. Other thoughts before we move on to Perak Yud Gimel? Shira, what's up? Isn't there some feeling that if if the Yaakov story goes back to the womb that, you know, he's also not sort of responsible for for how he turned out or, you know, was predetermined in some way? I know it seems like, you know, they could have had the birthright and the soup story, but in, you know, in tricking his father, but instead they went for the in the womb story. Yeah. So that's interesting. Um I wonder at that, that doesn't seem to be, at least in my read, the weight of what they're saying here. They actually seem to accuse him. It actually seems to accuse him of making a conscious choice, Babenden, right? Which is, I think, different than what maybe we would expect. But I think that that's actually specifically being brought as an example of even when you were before you were a baby, you were tricking people by, by your choice, right? It's an active verb. It attributes that trickery to him. Yeah. I have a memory of a shear that I heard a very long time ago. So I'm not 100% clear, but I remember Orly Canner in Florida giving a shear, connecting the lineage of the trickery from Rachel and, I mean, uh, Rivka and Yaakov to Mordechai and, and Binyamin, like he came from Binyamin. And we needed, Yaakov had to show that he had a power in him, like it, the trickery part of his personality that Hosea is describing as negative in the sheer that I heard, twisted it to be that it was showing that he wasn't just a simple Torah learning, sitting in tense guy, but that when push came to shove, he had to do something that was hard for him and take the bracha by tricking Asav and tricking his father and in taking it and and that wasn't only a bad thing it was a good thing because he had to have that quality in order to get the bracha sure or, so and, I think and it might be a yeah, positive thing. totally a hundred percent and there are so many positive things that we can learn about Yaakov and there's so many positive things that we teach about Yaakov and all of these stories in Bereshi a hundred percent. And yet Hosea is not choosing to do that. And that I think is exactly the point, right? If right. we wanted to give a sheer about how Yaakov Avinu was a tzaddik, I'm sure Hosea could have done that, right? But that that's exactly the point. Right? Hosea is not looking at the positive side of people's actions or the way they behaved or of the history. He's specifically recalling things in this negative light. And what I think is interesting about that when we think about the kind of general theme of the Sefer is if we remember who Hosea is and what his mindset is, it's actually very psychological, what I think, what he's doing. Hosea is the wronged man right, who is with a spouse who has hurt him and, and, and there's a lot of negative feelings. And that mirrors, right, God's feelings about B'nai Israel. And what I think is happening here is 
effective rhetoric for his point, but also so exactly how people slash God feels. You can have a past and a history that was maybe lovely with someone. There were lots of good things and there were lots of events that maybe were ambiguous, but because you had a good relationship, you chose to interpret them positively. But retroactively, once things have gone south, once things were got sour and bad things happened, all of a sudden, all of the memories of your relationship with that person start to look different and bad. And you can't really remember the good things. And you're like, oh, well, maybe they didn't, you know, maybe they weren't actually a good person. Maybe they're actually a bad person, right? Like there, there's a drive on the part of the Hosea slash God voice here. Like, of course, they're going to remember these days in a negative way. And of course, they're going to remember other things. Like the, the memories get twisted. The time at the very, very beginning was beautiful. But all these other things I have horrible memories of, right? The one's own recollection gets deeply impacted by the psychology of the current relationship. And I think in a lot of ways, that's what Hosea is trying to communicate in recollecting these historical slash Tanakh events right? That the drama of the current, of the now and the pain of the now is coloring even the way God is thinking back to the forefathers, right? Which is, I think, something very interesting and something for us to think more about. And we're going to keep going because we are going to finish on a positive note. So just like the safe air. So we have to get to the end. Otherwise, it'll be too sad. Um, we'll quickly, quickly look at Perak Yud Gimel. Um, a lot of these themes are, are somewhat similar, but we have this, uh, this the image of God of Egypt uh, comes up again. It's Anochi, Anochi, sorry, Anochi Hashem, Elokecha Me'eretz Mitzrayim, I'm your, um, your God of Israel, uh, since Egypt, the Elohim Zulati Lo Teda'ah. You should not know another God other than me. That's one right, the Aserat Hadzib wrote. Umoshi'ah ain bilti, you have nobody to save you except for me. This is very resonant in the book of Hosea. Don't go to Ashur, don't go to Egypt. Ain bilti, there's only me. And God says, Ani yidaticha bamidbar be'eret taluvot. I knew you in the desert in this parched land. I took care of you, says God. I gave you water. And here's our shoresh, our important root from throughout the book of Hosea of this knowledge that God's recollecting the time that they were in the Midbar and saying, you, you can't know, Loteda, you can't know any God other than me. And I knew you in the desert and I cared for you in this parched land. By the way, to just remind us the, that at the beginning, Hosea says, I'm going to kick out my wife. She's going to go to the Midbar and she's going to die of thirst. So there's an awareness that there's parched. The Midbar is a parched, dry place. But God is saying, no, 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 you were OK there. But what happened? Kimar Item, you grazed Mar Etzon, right? So it's, it's again, uh, reminding them like they're like sheep, right? So I, you, I, gave, I gave you water and you had good grass to eat in the Midbar. You grazed. And you were satiated. You had enough to eat. Sabu, once you were satiated, by Yaram Libam, you got a little haughty. You got full of yourselves. You're like, oh, I'm okay. Al Kain Shechechuni. And so you forgot about me. You thought you were okay. And so you forgot about me. This line is very reminiscent of um, when God says earlier in, Say for Hosea in chapter two, he, um, God says, She went after her lovers. My wife went after these other men who she's in love with. And she forgot about me. So there's this feeling of like, I gave you everything. I knew you, we were so close and you, you left me. You forgot about me. As opposed to yada. You forgot, you didn't know, you didn't have this emotional sensitivity and connection with me anymore. And so what happened? Because you forgot about me, says God, I became like a lion. Keep in mind in this metaphor right now, who are B'nai Israel? They're grazing sheep. Yeah, I gave you everything you needed. I was like, your shepherd, you're eating. And then all of a sudden I turned into a lion. I'm lurking like a, a leopard 
on the pathway. And I attacked you like a, um, a mother bear without her cubs, which is a very scary, scary, scary bear. We spent some time in Yellowstone a few months ago and it was, it was baby season. It was the spring and the moms with the bear, you got to be very careful about those bears, right? This is a vicious attack. And it's described very viciously. But across Sigorli bum, I tore open the sinews, Sigorli, Sigor is to close. So it's, I, I tore open the things that close in your heart. So there's this image of an attacking, ferocious beast tearing apart the little sheep, right? And they're going to, I'm leaving them for the beasts of the field. God's so angry. He says, You're destroyed. And I'm the person who's your savior, right? God said before, Moshia ain't built you. have nobody to save you except for me. And when you deserved it, I saved you. But now that you forgot about me and I attacked you, I'm a lion and you're a sheep. Nobody's coming to rescue you. There's nobody to save you. It's just me, right? It's very scary, right? It's like that, that creepy, like, haunted house it's like and nobody will hear you scream right there's nobody to help you it's this like very scary trapped feeling which is also reminiscent of chapter two where Hosea says about about the cheating wife I'm gonna put hedges around you and I'm gonna trap you in with thorns and nobody's gonna be able to save you and then oh this is Hosea is brilliant and he says the a melachecha efu am efo v'yoshiacha Where's your king? Who's coming to save you? You people who wanted a king, you people who had these kings who made all of these alliances and you had all these coups and at the end of the day, your kings can't help you. They can't help you at all, right? You have all of these towns and all of these judges and nobody can help you. You asked for them. You said, I want to have a king. I want to have a monarchy. And they can't help you, says God. Because I gave you a king in my anger. And I'm going to take back the king in my anger. And so this chapter, chapter 13, kind of wraps up and takes together the intensity, this rage, these images that Hosea has been developing throughout the Sefer. This idealization of the time in this des the desert, the, the, the reliance that he wants from B'nai Israel, the love that he craves, this newness, and yet it's rejected. And there's this God becoming vengeful and violent against not only the people, but also against the monarchy that has spiritually and politically failed them, that God is basically saying is worthless and can help you. You're putting your trust in the wrong place. Oh, when God says that you're, you're destroyed and you're no one to, to help you but me, yet previously we had said that God is the one who's bringing the destruction. You know, that because the Jews sinned, it's God who's destroying the Jews because they sinned. So is God helping them or is he destroying them? Good. So this is the emotional whiplash of the whole book. God, the, the emotions here like go back and forth all the time. And it's the very emotions that are off, like present in this raging, abusive husband, right? And that, that total being totally, totally emotionally tortured. It's this feeling of, I am so, I love you so much. And that's why I'm so angry. And that's going to make me so violent. And there's nobody to help you and save you. And really, I'm the one who really, oh, actually, no, I love you so much. Come back to me. I miss you. I want to go back to the way things were. I'm going to heal you and, and fix you up and, and, and fix all of your wounds. Never mind. I was the one who gave you those wounds. But let me put on the band-aid, right? Like, and it, it, the whole book is like back and forth. And that is exactly the emotional drama that God is experiencing and expressing. And so that's all very sad. Um, and yet we're gonna say our last eight minutes, we're gonna, we're gonna read our last chapter. And we've been through this emotional whiplash with, um, with, throughout the whole book. And we're gonna end with a beautiful, a, a positive moment, an image that is a little bit new, but picks up on a lot of the, the themes that we've talked about thus far. So quick transition. Um, and so let us, let us do chapter 14 and we're going to spend a little time on the last sentence as well, which is a very interesting sentence. Okay. This, some of these phrases should be a little bit, um, 
famous. I actually now realize what song I should have played at the start of class, right? But the begin, the chapter basically begins. The last, the first pasuk of the chapter seems to really belong in the preceding chapter. It's one of those very violent tear me tear apart verses, and this is really and there's a little samech or pay or whatever, and this is really where the chapter starts. Shuva Yisrael at Hashem Elokecha, come back, Bnei Yisrael, return, return to God. Ki kashalta ba'avonecha, you're stumbling in your sin. You're, and that's the image, remember, of the woman stumbling away, right? Like trying to run after her lover, stumbling around. And God says, don't, don't walk that way. Come back. Come back. Take with you words, right? This is a beautiful nigun um, for, for Elo. Uh, and return to God. Okay, what are the words? And this, we're going to come back to this phrase. Take words with you and go back to God. And say to Hashem, please forgive my sins. And take us well, take us back. And instead of bulls, instead of sacrifices, instead of animals, here are our lips. Let's talk. And this is bring with you words when you go and you reconcile with God. The real way, says Hosea, to reconcile is not to bring another sacrifice. He spent all of these pages talking about how it's like God, it's not what God wants. That's totally not the point. Instead, approach God with your words. This is a pasuk that's used to talk about tefillah, right? Which is a really important message for us in Elul of davening, of approaching God with words. But it's also this desire to approach God in dialogue and talk talk to God. Let's talk it out. Let's figure it out. Just like God says, I'm going to take you to the Midbar. We're going to go to the Midbar, to the wilderness, and I will Midaber, I will speak to you. God just wants to talk, right? We want to talk it out. And so take those words and go talk to God. And what else are you going to say? Ashur lo yoshienu, al sus lo nirchav. Ashur is not going to save us, right? He, God's waiting for that acknowledgement of we can't really get help from Ashur. No riding, no um, of none of our own military might is going to save us. Also, the sus here might be an allusion to Egypt as well. Egypt was famous for its export of horses. We've seen Ashur and Egypt go in pairs, so it could be this is also an admission. We don't need to be allies with Egypt. The lo nomar od Eloheinu, and we're not going to say the word Eloheinu lemaasayadenu of the things that we made. We're not going to call our idols, our hands, things of our hands are not going to be um, be called God anymore, right? Our, it's going to be our lips, what we say and talk to Hashem. That's what's important, not these things we made with our hands. Asher bach yirucham yatom, because you God have pity on orphans, and this is the chesed that. God wants B'nai Shal to learn, right? You, in order to know God and understand God, God says over and over throughout Hosea, you need to have chesed. And that's what's being recognized in this theoretical declaration that B'nai Israel will go and give. And they'll say, oh, we get it. Chesed, caring for people who need it. That's who you are, God. Oh, I know Hashem. And God says, when that happens, erpa meshuvatam, I'm going to heal you. And that word's really important, especially coming on the heels of that violent tearing apart imagery. There's been other verses in Hosea where it talks about how you have sores all over your body. You're sick, you're beaten up. And God says, I'm going to heal you. Oh, havim nidava, and I'm going to love you freely. A nidava, this is another play on words, and nidava is a kind of sacrifice. And God is saying, I'm not going to love your nidava. I'm not going to love your sacrifice. I'm going to love you with no barriers. I'm just going to love you. There's going to be just like love everywhere. Kishav apimimenu, because I'm not going to be angry at you anymore. There's been a lot of rage expressed in this sefer, and that's going to dissipate. That's going to go away. I'm going to be like dew to Israel. We've had this image of God as rain, as dew. Um, and in previous chapters, God accuses B'nai Israel. He says, you guys are like dew, you disappear, right? And now instead God's saying, no, I'm going to be like dew. And what's the water that I bring you going to do? There's going to be growth, new growth. And this is immediately supposed to remind us of the planting metaphors we've been talking about this whole time. You're planting bad things and bad things will grow. Please plant something good. And what's being grown now? What are you going to be, B'nai Israel? You're going to 
grow beautiful flowers, lilies or roses, and you're going to dig deep roots by yach shorashav kilivana, that's a very intense word, by yach means to hit. Your shoots are going to grow, the roots are going to grow so quickly, it's going to be like they're hitting into the ground. You're going to explode into a beautiful tree. Yelchu, you know, katav, the, the, um, the branches are going to reach upwards. You're going to be beautiful like an olive tree, and you're going to smell like the forests of Lebanon. This beautiful, also very sensory, very romantic imagery. Yashuvu Yoshvei Bitsilo, there are going to be people dwelling in your shade. Um, you're going to flourish, everything's going to grow, and you're going to blossom like a vine. Zichro Kiyen Levanon, and I'm going to remember you like I remember the taste of wine, right? Oh, wow. We have smells and sights and tastes and beauty, right? This is a beautiful image. And then Ephraim, this is the real clincher. This is what God wants Ephraim to say. What will you say, B'nai Israel? Mali od la'atzabim. Why do I need idols anymore? Right? What do I need from them? Ani aniti fa'ashurenu. I have answered God and I'm watching God. Fa'ani ki v'rosh ra'anan umimeni pireich nimtza. And I have grown lush and beautiful and I have gotten, and I'm growing fruit. Right? And so this is a moment where we're putting in Ephraim's words, this acknowledgement, not just of I want to go back to Hashem so you could heal me, but this real kind of letting go of anything in the past of like, oh, things now are amazing. I didn't need any of those idols anyway. And, um, and that is this last kind of image that God puts forward. And then we're going to look at the last sentence super quickly. But this last image of this vision of the future of Israel becoming, growing into this beautiful, strong, fragrant, loving tree slash people who have this beautiful relationship with God um, that is going to lead to finally something that happens internally within them. Somebody pointed out last week that through most of the book, we don't actually see B'nai Israel doing or trying or doing anything, right? It's all this God's internal drama, right? And we're ending this book by saying like, ultimately got the hope on God's part is, is that that brings about an internal change in B'nai Israel. I'm quickly just going to take two seconds to talk about the last pasuk, and then I'm happy to stay afterwards for questions. But that is really the end of the main body of the book. But there's this last section, this last pasuk that's kind of, you know, stuck in here. Um, and it says, Mi chacham eila. Who gets this? Who really understands this? This? What's this? Not this pasuk, right? The whole book. What's this book? Who really gets this book? Hopefully we do. We spent four weeks on it. So what do we need to know? Now, von um, right? Who's, who is wise and understanding that you can really understand the point of this book? Ki yesharim darche Hashem, because God walks yashar. God walks, where you, when you walk with God, there's a yashar path. V'tadikim yachubam. And righteous people can walk on that path. And sinners are stumbling about. They kind of just don't get it. This phrase seems to be kind of saying like, okay, guys, there's a way to get this right, this book right, and there's a way to get this book wrong, right? And who really understands? Who's going to really walk in the path? These tzadikim, there's a, there's a way to know this. And it's saying it's easy to trip up with this book. The Navi knows, right? The Navi itself knows that this Sefer is a complicated one to understand. It's easy to get distracted in the drama and the um, sordid nature of Hosea's personal life and focus on like the negative and right there's it's possible to misread this book. But the Navi is saying that tzadikim yachubam, that righteous people walk upright. And what's really fascinating is that this chapter begins with this image of stumbling. That God says to B'nai Israel, Shuva Israel at Hashem Elokecha ki kashalta ba'avonecha. You have stumbled in your sins. You're not getting it, right? And that's exactly the way it ends. Upushayim yikashlu bam. Sinners are, are yikashlu. You're stumbling around. 
And what is it, right? There's this knowledge, this understanding that how is it that we understand, like, how are we supposed to take this book? And it really touches back to the main theme that we've talked about a lot through this text, which is this idea of really of dot, of knowing. How do you know something? Who really, what does it mean to understand? It means to feel and to empathize with and to try to understand the genuine emotional experience that's taking place in this book. It's not really about the violence and the tearing up. It's not really about the sordid sex story. It's not really about the rejected kids. At the end of the day, you could get distracted by all of that, but that's stumbling, that's mixing you up. For us to walk straight through the path and really understand this safer, we need to approach it from a sense of empathy of God, of trying for one moment to really think about what it is that God's trying to say so that we don't get kind of caught up in the drama of the, of the otherwise of the interpretation. And ultimately, there's this desire and this love and this end goal of reconciliation and beauty and flourishing that God really wants, despite the anger that God feels over the cheating and the lying and the lack of faith, right? Underneath all of that is this vision of this blossoming cedar tree and this beautiful reconciliation of B'nai Israel coming back to God and saying, we love you and having it be free love, right? In the free love between God and B'nai Israel kind of free love, right? Oh, havam nidava, I love you freely. Um, please God, you know, we should be zocha to see that kind of love. Um, I'm happy to stay a little bit and answer questions um, if anybody has, but otherwise, Shavua Tov everyone. Our time for class next week is a little different. I believe it's 15 minutes earlier, but just take a look, make sure you check when you register for the Amos series. I think the timing is a little bit different, so just be warned, um, but we'll be back next week with Safer Amos. Thank you. This last sentence is kind of like it closes it